Uh, thank you, Ben. Um, and this is my first time also. I'm a, I'm a newbie. This is my first time here. So uh, I would encourage you to ask questions um, whenever you have them. And I will trust that they will be shared and I will be able to answer them. Um, but we we'll definitely will be taking a pause about halfway through. And I will uh, field any questions you have. Um, so there we go. Uh, the first thing I always like to do is to thank everybody in my research group. Uh, the students are really the ones that actually do all of the research. So uh, they, they really deserve, you know, all of the credit for all the work I'm going to present. I also have, you know, kind of taken a slight twist on, you know, a group photo the research that I'll talk about today is very interdisciplinary. You'll, you'll see that it includes a little bit of optics, a little bit of physics, a little bit of biology, a little bit of medicine. Um, and the reason why uh, my group is able to do all of this kind of in-house is because the students in the group come from a wide range of degree programs. Uh, so they're getting PhDs in uh, medical engineering, material science, chemical engineering, electrical engineering, biology, and chemistry. So it's really this kind of amalgam of degree programs that uh, allows this type of research to thrive. Um, so instead of just showing a picture of all of us eating ice cream, which is actually what we did today for lunch, uh, I'd like to at least you know show them slightly more formally uh, at the beginning of the talk. Um, so in our group, uh, kind of taking a step back, um, we work kind of at all the length scales. Uh, so we do some chemical synthesis where we make new types of materials. So new types of small organic molecules that will emit light. Um, so some of them are simple one photon processes, some are multi photon processes. Uh, and then we use some of those materials to make optical devices, so new types of lasers. And then we use some of those devices to make systems. Um, so make portable diagnostic systems or uh, detection systems for different types of diseases. Or, you know, to make new ways of trying to understand how light interacts with matter. So more like fundamental physics uh, experiments. So if you think about it, our research, instead of in terms of the kind of individual experiments, if you think of it more in terms of the challenges we're trying to solve, you can break it into kind of two areas. Uh, the first is integrated photonics. So this is thinking more of the types of systems we're trying to build. So different types of laser systems or different types of quantum systems we're trying to probe and understand or healthcare and wellness. So trying to develop new ways of doing diagnostics or new ways of developing therapeutics. So today, uh, I'm really going to focus on this second half, um, talking about a, a way that we've developed um, to try to understand basically why disease tissue has a different uh, sense. So why is it softer or harder than healthy tissue? Um, and that, that's really kind of the question that we decided to develop a system to try to understand that. Um, Originally, I was going to talk about two different projects, uh, but after getting some feedback from some of my students, who are my favorite audience to ask questions to, they told me I should leave time open uh, to ask the audience uh, if any of you needed advice or anything. So I decided to only talk about one scientific topic. Uh, so the first step in trying to develop a diagnostic is to pick a biomarker. Um, and we've kind of all lived this the, the past couple of years, um, and we're still living it today, right? Like, what is the best biomarker for a disease, right? So for COVID, right, is it the antigen test? Is it the antibody test? Is it the uh, you know, PCR-based test, right? Is it the RNA or the DNA-based test? So, like, how do you pick the best biomarker, the best indicator of a disease? Um, and depending on exactly what you're trying to detect, that, that indicator might be at the molecular level or the cellular level or it might actually be at the tissue level. So if you're actually trying to look for organ activity or variation in organ activity, looking for an individual genetic variation might not be the best indicator that your organ function has changed. So we were interested in looking at, you know, should we start looking for indicators of disease at kind of that building level, so more holistic level, or are individual genetic variations sufficient? And when we started kind of taking a step back and looking at this, we realized that the original diagnostic, like, you know, from BC, the original diagnostic was actually a tissue level diagnostic. Um, so Hippocrates would simply feel and try to palpate for lumps, right? And that's basically just 
trying to see, is there a change in the tissue structure, right? Is it rigid? Is it soft? Um, when you touch it, is it, does it cause pain? Um, and the same happened in the Tang dynasty as well. So this idea of trying to feel the diff, diff, or the changes, the differences in the elasticity of tissue was kind of the first step. And it was only once you know, we had the actual technology to look for things like genetic variations that we suddenly became so focused on uh, protein biomarkers that we kind of forgot that you could use these much more simplistic approaches. Uh, but mechanical behaviors and mechanical indicators are uh, wonderful hallmarks of a wide range of diseases like osteoporosis, uh, heart disease, cancer. So the idea that you could create like a, a coarse grain map of you know, certain changes in your tissue density or certain changes in your uh, heart structure can be directly linked to a specific disease type. It could be a much faster uh, approach for a physician to use to accelerate patient care. But the real question is, how are you going to do that measurement? Because doing measurements uh, or elasticity measurements on you know, rigid structures is fairly straightforward, but tissue is heterogene heterogeneous. In other words, it's you know, very complex, but it's, it's complex across multiple link scales. So it's complex both at the nano link scale, but then also at the macro link scale. And how people have tried to solve this is using a wide range of mechanical characterization methods. Um, so you can use an AFM to try to capture that nanometer link scale. The problem is in order to actually do that, uh, you have to digest the tissue, which means now you're losing a lot of that critical information uh, between the cells. And the most successful approach has actually been using uh, OCE or optical coherence elastography, um, which has micron scale resolution. So it doesn't quite capture a lot of the nanoscale resolution, um, but OCE hasn't like fully been deployed. Um, but OCE is, is definitely the, the best system right now. Um, the load frame system is the oldest uh, approach like on the books. Uh, and it's essentially uh, you have your sample and then you apply compression from the top and then you measure the amount of force uh, using a dash plus sensor on the bottom. Um, and this gives a very uniform force compression throughout your sample. And you can get resolution depending on the size of your dash plus sensor. Uh, you can get resolution in the centimeter range. The great thing about a load frame is that it's very, very well established. And so there's very nice theoretical algorithms to actually analyze your data automatically. Um, again, the downside is that the resolution is three orders of magnitude larger than you need it to be for a biological sample. Um, so you basically get one data point per sample. Um, so you're missing a lot of important information. So when we jumped into this field several years ago, um, we were interested to see if we could somehow build off of that uh, information or all the infrastructure that had been developed around the load frame approach, but instead of having just a single dash plus sensor, create a sensor array. And the sensor array that we were going to create was going to be an optical fiber sensor array, so it would have higher resolution and hopefully higher sensitivity. Uh, so the sensing mechanism for the optical fiber sensing array was essentially a refractive index change. So I'm gonna pause here uh, because what usually happens when I say that we're gonna use a refractive index change and use an optical fiber, um, there's an immediate assumption that what we're detecting is something attaching to the optical fiber and causing a refractive index change. What we're actually doing is applying force upon the optical fiber. And because we're using a special type of optical fiber that's called polarization maintaining optical fiber, when we apply force on it, we cause stress in the optical fiber. And because of something called the photoelastic effect, the uh, stress in the optical fiber induces a predictable refractive index change. So then we can directly correlate whatever polarization change we see into a Young's modulus of whatever was on top. So we're able to basically back calculate uh, the Young's modulus from that polarization change. So it's a refractive index sensor 
but not in the way that every other optical fiber sensor is a refractive index sensor. Um, so this is a pair of data, um, just kind of explaining that exact mechanism. So if you have a, uh, a top plate that applies force onto a sample, so the black is the actual actuator, simply showing the time trace. So if you apply force, so if you compress a sample, or if you relax the sample, um, the actual measured signal that you get out from the polarimeter measuring that polarization change is the blue signal. And this was actually done on pancreatic tissue. So pancreatic tissue is uh, a viscoelastic material. So therefore you expect this slightly nonlinear response. So how you would normally actually plot this is instead of making the x-axis time, you actually plot that as the amount of strain. Um, and then you can see kind of the classic uh, viscoelastic behavior where the compression and relaxation curves almost overlap, but not quite. And there's a little bit of energy loss when it comes back to its initial starting point. So, so far, um, we've looked at a lot of different uh, biological systems. We started off with salmon. Um, salmon was very convenient for many reasons, but mostly because we live in LA and there are lots of fish markets. Um, but we started off with salmon. Um, then, uh, we went to, uh, pork model. Uh, so we looked at almost every, uh, organ that we could try. Uh, so the nice thing about USC is that there's a medical school. And so we were able to, uh, work with a lot of the medical residents in the medical school, uh, while they were doing their training. Um, and then after they finished their training, we were able to use the same organs that they had just performed surgeries on so that we could validate our system alongside them to try to uh, do a, be ethical in our use of animals. Um, and then now that we've you know, kind of validated with a, a pig model, we're now moving on to human samples. Um, and a lot of the human samples are still ongoing. Uh, but Today, I'm going to kind of briefly talk a little bit about some of the cartilage, which is probably the one organ on here that uh, was not identifiable. Um, but these are just a few example results of some of the, the different organs, just to give you a sense of how all of the tissue in our body has completely different viscoelastic response when you apply force to it. Um, so the liver and the kidney um, have just a very simple uh, response. So it's, I mean, the liver is very elastic. Um, and then as you begin to move into the more complex materials like the pancreas and then especially the heart, uh, they actually begin to see more complex mechanical behaviors like buckling. Uh, and so particularly the pancreas, uh, we were able to finally actually develop uh, a predictive model for the pancreas, for the heart. We actually were never able to get a really good uh, predictive model to actually predict this behavior right there, the little loop at the end. Um, but cartilage. Uh, so cartilage, I personally developed a really big interest in um, because at the same time we were doing this research, I actually had a shoulder surgery uh, where due to a, a tear. And you would often, you might be interested uh, how often the reason why faculty members decide to do something is because of something that happened to them. Uh, but we began to be interested in looking at how the different types of cartilage have different mechanical behaviors and how different injuries can change the mechanical behaviors in the cartilage. But step one is obviously looking at the healthy cartilage. Um, so in your knee, and this is actually a schematic of a pig knee, not a human knee, but human knees look very similar. Um, in your knee, there are actually three types of cartilage. There's the articular cartilage um, that's behind your uh, femur. There's the articular cartilage patella, which is like basically right behind your kneecap. And then there's the meniscus, which is basically just used to uh, as a shock absorber. So you can imagine, given the fact that these all have three very different roles, um, they're going to have slightly different mechanical structures from a materials perspective. So if we look at the ACF, which is the top, um, it has, you know, that same kind of curve where, you know, the, as we apply force versus as we 
release the force, there's a, you know, an energy release, but what's very different between the ACFC and the patella is that there is a significant energy release on the patella. Um, whereas on the, uh, ACFC, it never fully goes back to zero. And then the one that I found particularly fascinating was um, on the MC where it actually has a totally different shape and it actually goes negative um, as we're applying force. And we'll go into all the different mechanical behaviors we're observing in that data. So there's three types of mechanical behaviors that can occur in cartilage. So cartilage, unlike, for example, heart cells or liver or kidney, cartilage is very, very, very structured. Um, so it consists of a bunch of sheets of cells that are all nicely stacked. Um, and when they have a, a force applied to them, they can deform. And depending on the strength of the force, that determines how they actually deform. So kind of the, usually the first step is buckling. So they go from being in a, a nice like line of vertically oriented cell sheets to having a slight buckle. And in a stress strain curve, it would look like this. So these would be buckling points. Um, and usually you would see at most um, as we compress, we see two buckling points. And then as we relax, we see the relaxation of one of those buckling points. So kind of the second thing that can happen is if we apply too much uh, stress the system, we can actually begin to see the sheets begin to delaminate. In other words, your cartilage should have sheets that are all nicely adjacent to each other. But if you apply too much force, then they can delaminate permanently. And then that causes what on the stress strain curve looks like the inverse of a buckle. And usually this type of behavior is non-reversible. Um, in other words, you start off like with two sheets that are parallel. And then when you finish, you have a completely different physical conformation. And then the third is bridging. Um, and bridging is actually the worst of all scenarios. Um, so bridging, you start off with, you know, your nice cartilage cells all lined up. They're mobile. And then you apply a lot of force and then they network. And for cartilage, which is supposed to be a shock absorber, you want your shock absorbers to be slightly soft and squishy so that they can actually absorb energy. When, it, when they bridge like this, so when the cells actually network between each other, then that means it's becoming more rigid, which is when uh, it is less able to absorb shock. And this bridging behavior on a stress strain curve, oops, on a stress strain curve appears as a sharp peak um, and usually happens early in the stress strain curve. So if we look at all of these data, um, but we we'll focus in on the buckling. Um, so on, I can just actually just go back. So for example, the uh, MC, um, you can see that there's clear like buckling that happens here because it goes up and then it nicely relaxes back and goes down again. But we were able to go through and pick out all the different behaviors and all the different data sets. Um, so we identified the first buckling point. We called that the primary buckling point. And then the second one was the secondary buckling point. So not, not every data set had a secondary loading buckling point because not every data set did we apply enough force to actually have that. Um, but seeing as the main point of cartilage was to actually be able to handle a load. And the main way that cartilage actually releases that load is to buckle. Um, all cartilage had a primary loading buckling point, which means that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. And they all had an unloading buckling point, which again is what would be expected. Um, additionally, uh, both the MC and, and ACP had secondary loading buckling points. Um, and our hypothesis on this is that it's probably because they their primary job is to be shock absorbers. Um, and so like their job is to try to be able to handle high strains. Um, granted, we only saw that secondary loading buckling point at very high strains, which were actually above what you would normally see 
like as a pig, you know, on in your normal pig life. Uh, but still the fact that they were able to actually have a response means that, you know, it's, they were doing the behaving as, as you would expect them to behave. Um, so it was, we were really excited. We could actually pick up and detect this type of behavior. So, so that was all the science I wanted to talk about today. So, so for this work, we, we basically designed this system, built it, showed it. Um, I will make one comment um, on this data. Uh, one thing we did notice was that in order to actually get this data where we could actually detect the uh, physiologically realistic and reasonable and rational results, it was really important to actually use samples that had been taken within two hours of resection from the animal. If we, start, if we started using uh, tissue that had been either stored or freeze thawed or something like that, then we got completely incorrect results and non-realistic results. So it's sample preparation is really important when uh, working with biological systems. And uh, NIH actually has uh, an entire program just looking at impact of sample preparation on uh, experimental results. So super important. That's my last pitch. Okay. Um, so that's all the science I wanted to talk about. If there are any questions on the science or anything else, I'm happy to entertain questions. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, so we will, we do have some questions about the, the science part. And it, like, uh, as Dr. Armani very kindly said, uh, you know, if you have questions about anything else, um, I know she, when we had talked previously, she spoke specifically about uh, early career research, that kind of stuff, um, or, you know, grad school, postdocs, any of that. Uh, I think it's all kind of fair game. Um, but we'll start with the, the questions that have been asked already. Uh, first one was, uh, is that McConkie's agar on your opening slide? <laughs> yes. Um, so hold on. So these pictures um, are actually, they're a pair of pictures that I took when I went back in the lab in March of 2020. Um, okay. As so, so I, I was actually like I, I as the PI, I was I want to be really clear about this. Mm -hmm. I, I was back in the lab. Yes. Which, yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't, I don't get to say that very often. Um, and uh, so, my husband and I and two faculty at USC and uh, two of my PhD students, we did an entire project looking at um, building like little portable UVC boxes to help the uh, USC medical system with their PPE needs. Oh. And so part of it was obviously like we built them because I have you know a bunch of EEs in my group mm -hmm. and my husband owns a small uh, engineering company nice. so they could like actually manufacture them and make them. Okay. Um, but you know, obviously before the hospital wants to use them, we had to make sure they worked. Sure. So this was the test showing that they worked oh, that's where, very cool. yes, where the, the top one was when we didn't expose to, we didn't put the sample inside our box and the bottom one was when we did. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, and, and we did this measurement in the uh, pathology lab at, uh, the, the Keck Medical School at USC. Um, so I cannot tell you exactly what type of agar it is. Mm -hmm. um, I know it really likes growing bacteria. It's okay. really good at that. Um, I, I know about the bacteria, but I don't know the details of the agar. Okay. I, I can, it's in the paper that we wrote about it. <laughs> so I, <laughs> theoretically, I should know. Um, I was in charge with, uh, I plated the bacteria. I did all the optics part of it. Our okay. collaborator who's in the pathology lab, um, she's actually head of the pathology lab at USC. Um, she's the one that, that actually did the, the plate preparation and all of yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But she was, yeah, she, she was like equally excited to me because like she also w usually wasn't in the lab. I'm about to say, but, that's, that's a great way to get in and do some stuff. Yeah, but uh, so what, what happened at USC was in like the second week in March, they basically shut down, sent everybody home, mm -hmm. and you could only be in the lab if you were a PI because like, you know, I can't make my students go into the lab, but like yeah. I can voluntarily choose to go into the lab. Sure. So then what happens is like 
I, I went into the lab and then the other faculty member went into the lab. So like the faculty were in the lab together. That's very So cool. it was, yeah. So it was a lot of fun. Yeah, hey, that's um, awesome. Yeah, we, we, we so experienced yeah. the same thing. Like we had to, we completely shut down and yeah, it was something. <laughs> yeah. So at, at least like I, I got back in the lab. Yeah. That's, and that's... then like I, and uh, one of my PhD students did a lot of the modeling because he could do modeling from home. Mm hmm that's very yeah. cool. Yeah. That's but cool. I have like all these pictures of like me in the lab, <laughs> in a lab coat. Yeah, man. Absolutely. <laughs> you, got, you got to celebrate it. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Like, yes. <laughs> I'll have to make sure I get the paper from you and, and include uh -huh. that in the description. That's, that's a really cool story. Uh, let's see. Our next question is, uh, okay, so does the, does the load frame require a sample that's reasonably uniform uh, in terms of its compressibility? Um, so we were using samples that were, um, I would say probably about a centimeter by a centimeter. Um, this is obviously a cartoon, um, but they were about a centimeter by a centimeter by about a millimeter to two millimeters thick. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't say like reasonably uniform. They need to be reasonably uniform over the length of the optical fiber. Okay. Uh, but I mean, we were also using like we're now using like pieces of tumor, which there is no reasonably uniform when you're talking about like a resected piece of a tumor okay. like that. Yeah. That's not a thing. Um, they're yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they're not all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. They're all over the place. Okay. Yeah. Um, so if, okay. So on the, the, the stress strain figures that you showed, if the tissue doesn't relax back, how mm -hmm. does that how does that affect the measurement like can, can you still do these mm -hmm. types of measurements and, and you just yeah. say it, it just doesn't come back or yeah so so that that's a great question um so i one thing i didn't say on this data is uh the reason why these are all numbered like one two three four five is because the, these are the runs like we actually took like the same sample and we just tested it five times in a row um so these aren't like you know, five different runs on five different samples, but maybe we're only showing five, but we actually did 10 measurements. Okay. So they're like five runs taken back to back. Um, so yes, it doesn't, it doesn't come back to exactly the same starting point. Mm -hmm. um, but what that means is that when you compress the sample, the sample, uh, you've basically slightly deformed the sample during the process of doing your measurement. Mm -hmm. Um, so for example, with the kidney at the uh, lowest strain, the data looks like kind of nonsense. Okay. Um, and it's, it's basically what that's telling you is that you aren't really applying enough strain to actually keep the sample still. So okay. you're just getting a lot of noise. So you, you just shouldn't even really look at that data. Um, oh. and, and, and that's probably because of where we had the sensor placed, right? Cause the kidney has all of those like ducks in it. Mm -hmm. And so if we had our sensor placed like right on the edge of one of those ducks, and then as we're applying force to it, the sensor is like wobbling across one of those ducks, then we're just going to get just all kinds of nonsense. But if we're applying a little bit more strain, then it, we aren't going to see that artifact as much. Okay. So that makes sense. So if, yeah. if you have a sample, uh, and I, it may be the case that, that nothing that you look at actually does this, but let, let's say you had a sample and like, and you compress it and it doesn't, it doesn't rebound at all. Like just, you know, again, maybe, maybe uh, a tissues. great, no, 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 no. Um, a great sample. Like for example, if you have uh, a sample that is very porous and has a lot of water, hmm. right? Okay. So like, imagine if you have like a hydrogel, Oh yeah. Um, and like, you know, it's filled with water and you can press it and then like you squish all of the water out. Yeah. And so then w when you relax back, right, like all that water isn't necessarily going to get sucked back up. Right. Right. Yeah. So right. actually figuring out how much force you should apply, right? Like what your strain rate should be that that entire thing is part of your experimental trial optimization. Okay. So, so if you apply too much force, you can like just totally pancake a, a sample, that and it will not recover. That makes sense. Okay. 
All right, that's that's good to know. That's that's, that's now that you say that, it makes a lot of sense. So yeah. Uh, let's see. Do different lobes of liver have differences in their elasticity? Absolutely. Yeah, it's, especially in like people. Yeah. Okay, so like person to person, it's it's pretty. Is mm -hmm. it pretty really widely different, or is it? No, it's so subtle? it's it's more subtle. But um, I mean, even like throughout your liver, it's it varies. There isn't like a single precise value, right? Because it's it's a okay. it depends on like the fat content in your liver. It mm -hmm. they're very non uniform. Um, actually looking, doing like a deep dive into the liver is something I really wanted to do, um, because there's, there's a, there's just a lot of interesting information. Um, but we have an IRB pending, but we haven't been able to get any samples. Um, because the problem is in order for us to do a really good job, um, we need to have, cause what I want to look at is the relationship between, um, liver cancer and, uh, basically healthy livers um, okay. because it's known that there's uh, a really strong connection if you have uh, any kind of like stiffness mm -hmm. you know due to drinking or something like that um, and having cancer but I, I would like to look at you know people who haven't already been diagnosed with some sort of liver disease okay. but I haven't yeah but getting samples is very hard Okay, yeah, I, can, I can imagine. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so most people who are willing to give samples already have liver disease. Um, oh, I got you. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that, that, that so so they're sense. ineligible. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yep. Uh, let's see. What are, okay, so what, what are the prime, I think you, you kind of covered this, but I'll go ahead and ask it just <laughs> in case there's anything extra. Um, what are the primary differences between the stress strain runs? Is it different strains or the position at which the strain is applied? I think, I think it it's is the stress strain figures. Yes, yes, it is. So it's not the position; it is the the amount of strain. Okay. So you, so you, pretty, so you fix yeah. your position and then just and just go mm -hmm. through several different. Uh, yeah. Of strain. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. There's one. Okay. Yeah. Y yeah. So, so for example. The, the runs are the exact same thing five times, but mm -hmm. then this one, for example, this first data set is the strain at 10, right? Mm -hmm. And then this one, it's 20 and this one 30. But if we go here, oh, no, they're, they're all to 10, 20 or 30. Okay. So they're all the same, same numbers. So never mind. Okay. Makes it, that's a good way to do it because, like, you know, you talked about how finding the, the right amount of strain to yeah. apply. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so I'll ask, I, I've got a few questions about, since I, I think I'm still technically early career. <laughs> I may, may, may be stretching that a little bit, but I, I, I have some questions generally. Uh, mm -hmm. that, and, and if anybody else has some, the chat, please feel free to ask. Um, do you have any general recommendations in terms of, like, especially funding early on? You know, speaking, you know, at least personally, it can be tricky to to get. Um, do you have any any just general thoughts on how to help uh, on how how an early career researcher might get that that initial funding to kind of get things kick started? You know, get the get those first sets of data and then sort of roll that into into future funding. Mm -hmm. um, so it obviously is going to be very you know research topic specific. Um, but I always say like, reach out to program managers. Um, so program managers, like their, their job on one hand is to be gatekeepers to funding. On the other hand, their job is also to fund like the most talented researchers and program managers can be invaluable assets. Um, and especially NSF program managers are incredibly helpful people. Um, like they want to help you get funded because they want to just fund the most talented people. Mm -hmm. So like if you, as like an early career researcher, if you like reach out to an NSF program manager before you apply and you say like, this is what I'm thinking about submitting. Do you think this is appropriate for your program? You know, like they obviously can't say like, yeah, 
definitely you should submit that. I'm definitely going to fund it. Right. But a lot of times I've reached out and I've been like, yeah, so I think this is idea, this idea is appropriate for your program. And they're like, yeah, that's not really my program. It's really more this program. You should talk to that program manager. Okay. So they can like, they can help you figure out like, is your idea right for the program? If not, where is it right for? And they can give you advice on like things that they've seen other people with similar ideas, like go wrong. So like what things to emphasize, what things to de-emphasize so they can help you do a better job the first time and avoid like second and third and fourth submissions. Always and the good. other thing, <laughs> yeah. And the other thing, yeah. And the other thing is, you know, on one hand, like make sure you don't spend a ton of time on like endlessly volunteering and doing a ton of service for no reason, mm -hmm. but you know, be on like a few NSF panels. And if NIH is also in your wheelhouse, you know, be on a few NIH panels uh, just to see what it is like. Um, there's a couple reasons. First, you'll see that there's a ton of really great ideas that don't get funded. So it'll make you feel a little bit better when yours don't get funded because you'll realize that there's a lot of amazing people whose research isn't getting funded. Okay. Um, and then uh, you'll also see, you'll get a better idea of just general trends. Because um, mm -hmm. I've I was on... Uh, like I, my first NSF proposal that got funded, I still don't know why it got funded. Like okay. looking back, <laughs> it probably, it was probably like the worst written p proposal I've ever submitted. Okay. Like I, I would not have funded it. Like, I don't think it, I don't think it just, the ideas in it were great, but the actual execution of the proposal was horrible. Okay. Um, I, I, I mean, I was a new professor. I didn't know what I was doing. Sure. I think somebody just like decided to give me the benefit of the doubt and was nice. Um, but the, uh, but the panels, when I was on one, I got a better sense of like what a proposal should look like. And if I kept writing proposals like that first proposal, I would have never gotten funded again. Okay. So being on panels gives you that big picture insight to like, what should a proposal look like? What are the reviewers looking for? Mm -hmm. What, who are the reviewers, right? Like you can meet other reviewers and you can see like, like who are these people who are going to be judging you? Um, sure. Yeah. And so that's really helpful. Okay. That's really good advice. Um, it, it's uh, just, just to be clear, it doesn't make it any less maddening when you're proposals get rejected oh, sure. still yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, 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 yeah. I, think, I think that never changes yeah uh what are your opinions on preprints and grant submission i'm a big fan of preprints for so many reasons okay. yeah so many reasons um i mean the publishing situation right now is horrible i have a like so one of my phd students started his but job last March and we just got a decision back on the manuscript that was in his PhD. He defended his PhD last March, like March, 2021. Mm -hmm. And yesterday we finally got a decision back on a manuscript that he submitted last March. That's ridiculous. Yeah. So that's 11 months. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's reason number one, why I'm a big fan of preprints. Cause I mean, what was I supposed to do? Just hold on to him? Right. Uh, like, I mean, he needs a job. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So no, I think, I think preprints are awesome. Um, okay. It's kind of making me think, do we really need journals? Like, shouldn't, shouldn't there just be a way to like, just not do the journal thing anymore? Um, because if we can, if we could have a way to annotate preprints, then we could just, not have manuscripts wait for 11 months in review. That would be nice, yeah. <laughs> that would be really yes. nice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I think preprints are super important. Um, things things should be posted on Chem Archive or Archive or Bio Archive or Med Archive or whatever your archive flavor is. Mm -hmm. um, and it adds uh, validity when you say that you have like preliminary results because it's no longer just like a data set is actually a data set in context. Okay. Uh, I need 
need to see if there's a chemical engineering archive. I don't know if there is one. <laughs> so, so there's there's an Eng archive and then there's Chem archive. Okay. All right. All right. That's good to know. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you address the line between preliminary data and published work in the preprint and reviewer comment? Can you say that again? Sure. How do I? How do you address the line between preliminary data and published work in the preprint and re in reviewer comments? They, are, are I don't we, think I've. Yeah, I was gonna say I don't think I've ever had to address that. Rama, can I've you had to. Anything? Yeah. Maybe, maybe Rama, I, can you clear it up just a little bit. I'm not. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see, I guess I'll ask a quick question. Uh, okay. About uh, something else, real quick. Um, so, in terms of, do you have any recommendations in terms of, for especially for again for early career researchers who are doing maybe their first submission of their own paper, uh, or, or I guess their their own uh, maybe their first corresponding author paper or something like that? Uh, any again general guidelines uh, for somebody in that situation? Yeah, uh, the cover letter, although I know there's a lot of debates on this, the cover letter is really important. Mm -hmm. um, if you've never written a cover letter before, uh, ask somebody who has written a cover letter. Mm -hmm. um, and the higher impact factor the journal, the more important the cover letter becomes. So, again, if you've never written a cover letter for a journal get a sample from somebody. Um, don't try to like reinvent a wheel that hundreds of thousands of people have invented before you get an example so that you, you have a good starting point. Um, okay. that, yeah, I, I spent way too much time re optimizing something that I should have just asked somebody for. So, so don't be me. Don't do that. <laughs> That's I mean, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, so I think it sounds like for on the, the question about the line between preliminary data and published work in a preprint, um, it sounds like the, the reviewer comments are on a grant. Oh, okay. So okay. I, yeah, okay. So the comment was specifically that you have proposed this work, but you've already accomplished 80% of the work as per your preprint. And so the, the grant proposal is not taking it far enough. Yeah, so that's going to depend on the agency. And then also this kind of gets to the benefit of being on panels and you'll realize that sometimes a panel is just looking for a reason to say no um and it's and it's not necessarily something that you can actually do anything about um does that usually yeah. happen because the because of a lack of funding or yeah Okay, so they so basically like they have 50 paper, fifty proposals that are all really good, they can only fund 20, and they have to, so they got to find a, a, a reason to say 30 of them don't qualify? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, that's tough. <laughs> that's, yeah, it's, it's really tough. tough. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, any, what, what are your thoughts on... Uh, working with with industry uh you know in terms of like you know like i, I told you we're doing some work with we, we work mm -hmm. with some in, in, yep. industrial companies um just yeah no i i what are your thoughts there yeah i i love all of my industry collaborators i think they're great people um i think they add a real um like credibility and just concreteness to the research that goes on in the lab yeah that's very true it is nice to sometimes have a, an application that, that you're aiming mm -hmm. towards. Yeah, yep. absolutely. So, so one last question, and then I have to go because sure. it's, it's like 11 there, but it's 8 here, and I'm going to eat dinner. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> yes. Um, so I, I'll do one last question then. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, if my brain can remember what it was. Uh, oh, okay. So in, how about, let's talk about networking. Um, just again, mm -hmm. generally... Uh, Networking, you know, if again, as an early career researcher, maybe it can be a little bit difficult because you, you know, you're a relatively unknown quantity. Any, any advice for somebody who's in that situation that maybe wants to seek out collaborators, whether, you know, domestically, let, let's say, let's say not at, at your own university or, mm -hmm. or, or school. Yep. So somewhere else, either domestically, internationally, um, you know, any, any general tips for that? Yep. Um, so first off, 
if you're an early career researcher, I would recommend there's a early career PI Slack as well as future PI Slack. I think both of those are great. Um, I'm, I'm a member of mid-career Slack. Uh, so I think those, those are great places kind of to start. Um, I also, I found a lot of uh, friends on Twitter, strangely enough. Um, I never thought I'd mm-hmm. actually be saying that. Yeah. <laughs> um, those, those words are coming out of my mouth. Um, and then, you know, at conferences, like, honestly, just like be brave. Uh, that's like the, it's really easy to say. Um, but one of my like best friends in optics right now, uh, when I was like a first year assistant professor, I just walked up to him after an invited talk and asked him if he would go have lunch with me. And okay. he surprisingly enough, he was like, yeah, I'd love to go have lunch. And then we went and had lunch and like, I never thought he was going to say yes. And I had never met him before, uh, but he was in my field and yeah. And we went and had lunch. And then after that, like he later invited me to be you to give a talk and you know, we're, we're still friends. Um, That's awesome. But just like, yeah, just have, you have to sometimes just take a deep breath and try yeah, uh, <laughs> that's the, the that's the story of yeah. inviting people to do this this show. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, yep. That's that's great advice. That's absolutely fantastic. All right, well, we won't keep you from dinner. Um, if I can get you to hang around for just one second, we'll talk very yep. briefly. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming out. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you for all the great questions. Uh, we will be back next week um, with uh, Dr. Dennis Cow uh, from McAllister College. Um, and we hope to see you back out here next week. And, um, yeah, thanks for coming out. Uh, be safe. Get boosted if you haven't yet. And uh, we'll see you next week. Uh, thank you to our speaker, Dr. Armani. Uh, have a great evening, everybody.